we have a really rich conversation planned. Um, and in a little bit, we'll also take questions from the audience uh, and from our online audience. Um, before we begin, though, I'd love to reintroduce our panel. Uh, Robert Stone is the writer, producer, and director of Taken Hostage, his ninth film for American Experience. Thank you, Robert. Barbara Rosen became an eloquent and compelling spokesperson for her husband, Barry, and his fellow hostages during the crisis, using the media to keep their plight before the eyes of the world. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Barry Rosen was the U.S. Embassy press attache in Iran when he was taken hostage. He was held for 444 days in the, light, in the late 1960s, Barry served in Iran as a member of the Peace Corps, where he became fluent in Farsi and became thoroughly enamored with Iranian history and culture. Happy to have you here, Barry. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm actually gonna start with Robert. Uh, Robert, this is a story that certainly people of a certain age um, in America throughout the world think that they know, um, that they remember seeing on television, on the nightly news. What drew you to this story and what did you think you could bring to it that was different? Well, um, the, the, the hostage crisis happened when I was in college and um, I had a history, I was studying history, and I had a history professor who stopped the course that we were studying and devoted the rest of the term to telling us about the history of, of, of Americans' relationship with Iran, the CIA um, coup in 1953 that overthrew the first democratically elected government in the Middle East and installed the Shah as an absolute dictator, the rise of the, 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 the Sabak, the secret police we mentioned in the clip, um, um, which was an incredibly brutal secret police in Iran, and just told us the whole history that we were not getting on the nightly news about this thing. So um, it had always been in my mind that, um, that uh, this is an amazing story that most Americans really don't know. We, we tend to see uh, all of these events in the Middle East that have happened over the last 40 years kind of in isolation. You know, the, the first Gulf War, the, the second Gulf War, Afghanistan, 9-11, all of this. It's just this blur of one thing after another, um, but without any context of how this all came about. And, and um, I've always felt that the Iranian Revolution was the cataclysmic turning point um, that completely altered the history of the Middle East. And, and everything that's happened since has its roots in that. And, it, and that event has its roots going back to 1953. So I thought, and I was thinking about this, we're watching the clip here, just, if you wanna understand what's going on, Biden going to Saudi Arabia, trying to make a deal with the Saudis, you know, the, what's going on with the uprising in Iran today with women, led by women, who want their rights back, which they had. If you wanna understand any of this stuff, and why we're so involved in the Middle East and have been for the last 40 years, you need to understand the Iranian Revolution and what brought it about. So I thought if I could make a film, it would explain that and make it tell, put it into a personal human story that I could make a contribution to our better understanding about this whole situation. I have to say, um, Robert, when you, when I first came to American Experience and we first started talking about this film that was already in, in progress, um, it's a four hour project as we mentioned over two nights. Um, I thought before seeing anything, before seeing a script, uh, when I learned that you planned the first two hours of the film as backstory and that we would not even get to the day that the hostages were taken until the third hour of a four hour film, I thought you were insane. I was just like, <laughs> I remember. why? <laughs> yeah, like it's called Taken Hostage. It's right. about the experience right. of, of Barry and the others. Right. Um, but one of the things that's so incredible and you talked about this and we see this a little, we saw it a little bit in this clip 
is exactly what you said. You cannot understand the crisis without understanding everything that happens before it. Um, and I think that one of the things that, that the audience will, will see and that viewers will appreciate is this incredible backstory. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Barry and Barbara, I'm so curious to hear how you felt the first time that you saw the film, because you you have seen both parts. Um, this is a, a painful history, obviously, that, that you lived through. What What's it like to see yourselves on the screen in this way? Well, you know, there, there are moments that I, I look at at the uh, film and I say, uh, is that really me? Um, and even during the interview, uh, the interview was so very personal. Uh, Robert really was able to extract so much information from me that I particularly didn't really think that I had. But more than anything else, it was a, a personal review of, of that experience in, a, in many ways a very painful way. Um, first, let me say it's an honor for me to be here at the Kennedy Center for one important reason. I, I was a Peace Corps volunteer, and if it weren't for President Kennedy, I would not have been one. And I feel that the Peace Corps has been an amazing part of American life. And so, I mean, I think Robert was able to extract that, that love that I have for Iran. and. And that period I, that I was a Peace Corps volunteer and bring it back home to me again and again and again, how much I really cared about a country that fell apart. And I think it, I think it fell apart for many reasons, but for me, it's, it's a personal regret that it has been falling apart for the last 43 years. But no doubt about it, America played a very vital role in the destruction of, of Iran. And so I think Robert is very right to say that Iran plays a central role in modern Middle Eastern history vis-a-vis -vis the United States. But the United States also has to look inward at itself and how it played a role in destabilizing a country that could very well have been a very democratic country, a paradigm in the Middle East. So I would say it's hard to look at the film but I'm happy that I was part of it because it, it brought out the, the personal part of our lives. And also, I think it might give a picture to people who really don't understand Iran, why it happened. It's also the, um, I think the sacrifice that families make when one, you know, the husband, the wife, whoever goes over to serve and leaves the rest of the family back at home. And we see it with the military today who get sent over overseas many times on their missions. And what happens to the family? What happens to the children? What happens to the spouse? What happens to the, the, the parents, the cousins, the sisters-in-law? You know, everybody. Everybody becomes, is so affected. And looking at this and seeing my kids when they were so young and you know you think you know things up here but you don't know them here and then you see this and it brings the feelings back up to the, the surface and that's what that's what I see when I look at this here and it really it's so it's it's so personal and so touching and um, you wonder how how you did get through it, but you did, you know? Robert, um, this, as, as Barry and Barbara just said, um, this is clearly a, an important geopolitical story. It's, it's, it's important in unpacking uh, U.S. Mideast relations, but it is also very much a personal story of these two people and their family and the families of all of the other hostages. How did you decide to use the Rosens as such an important vehicle for telling this story? There are a lot of ways you could have told this story. Why, why them? Um, 
I have a kind of a philosophy about documentary films, which I've sort of played out over the years in most of the films I've made, that I think um, I information is communicated through story, and story is about character and people. And so rather than go and interview 50 people with this kaleidoscopic um, uh, voices uh, talking about where the, where the event itself becomes a central character, I like to do it the other way and really focus on uh, finding a group of people, in this case it was just a half a dozen of people, who had personal experience with the event, um, who could come at it from different perspectives and make the audience feel the story almost like a lived experience, right? So when I met Barry and Barbara, um, it just immediately became clear that they would be the central characters for this film because their story, they're such incredible people and they were so open and they, they not only have a relationship to the events that took place, they also have this relationship with each other. And I thought that, um, um, I knew that that would make the audience feel the story and go on a ride with them and that through emotion, you remember things. If you just watch something, you don't feel it, the next day you're gonna forget it. If you feel something personally, you're gonna remember the next day and might carry it with you. So, and then I wanted, uh, yeah, the, the wasn't, I, I did at one point think, well, I'm just gonna make the whole film about Barry and Barbara because they're so fantastic, as you can see. Um, but I thought, well, now we need some other voices. So I also uh, brought in um, Gary Sick because I wanted the perspective of what was going on inside the White House. And I was particularly interested in obviously the media aspect, which we haven't talked about, which I hope we will, um, the media aspect is such an important thing, a part of the story, and how it transformed the news media. So I knew I wanted some journalists, and I, I was, I was uh, in just on the research, it became clear to me that the role of women in Iranian society and the changes that had taken place under the Shah was such an extremely important part of the revolution and had triggered so many things among the mullahs who couldn't stand the idea of women being liberated as they were under the Shah. And so to have some female journalists who, saw, who covered that aspect, because it, it was kind of an un, uncovered aspect of this at the time, um, I thought would be um, really important. So I found Hillary Brown, who you didn't see in this clip, um, and a Carol Jerome, who two pioneering female journalists, some of the first female foreign correspondents to go into, you know, kind of combat situation. And Carol, who d you did see, has just absolutely remarkable story of being with Sadiq Gotsbadeh, who became the foreign minister of Iran and, and the lead hostage negotiator, and her inside story of that. So that was the kind of core cast. And of course, James Roberts, who was on the rescue mission, who was also in the embassy with Barry. So yeah. So I definitely want us to talk about the, the media and the role of the media in, in this story. But before we do, Barry, can you just tell us what is it about Iran that was so captivating to you in, in the beginning? Well, I think um, most Americans really just don't, don't get it. But there is a, a beautiful side to Iran uh, that most people just don't know. Um, the people first are really very decent, kind, considerate. Whatever you see on television and the exposés of uh, people marching here and there and screaming and yelling, that's not Iran, the Iran that I knew and most Iranians know. Iranians are great poets. They love art and music. The cuisine of Iran is fantastic. The hospitality of Iranians is amazing. The history and geography of Iran and the, am the amount of, uh, of historical uh, edifices all over the, over the, uh, the plateau are, are enormous. So Iran had, has had great contributions to world history. I think most Americans don't know this, but Iran was the great power vis-a-vis -vis Rome during the third, fourth, and fifth century. And it was one of the great contributors to art and music in Islam 
and in fact, it really brought out Arabic culture, in fact, Arabic language, even though Persian is not an, 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 a Semitic language, it picked up many of the aspects of, of Arabic and used it in ways that are unusual. So for many reasons, and I think more personal than anything else, I fell in love with Iran. I started learning Farsi, walking through the streets, going to the bazaar, talking to people, spending leisurely time with them, um, getting adopted by Iranian families. Um, um, and though there was a, has always been a, a small Jewish um, community in Iran, at the time I was there, uh, I was involved with the Jewish community of, of Iran and saw them as my family, as if they were my, my own personal family. So for me, Iran, in many ways, is my second home. And I've always felt very strongly about that place and, that, and the time that I spent there. And unfortunately, I know that I'll never be able to go back, but I, I still feel that one day, perhaps, there might be an opportunity. And I have to say that what you're seeing right now in Iran today, this movement headed by young women, and men all over the, over the country is actually a prolongation of the Iranian revolution, the real Iranian revolution, freeing Iranians from oppression and, and uh, living under fundamental decency and democracy. Mm -hmm. The picture that you paint of, of Iran in the, in the 60s and, and before um, is one that is, that is really warm and, and beautiful. Uh, and that obviously informed your experience. When, when did you start to note a change, or, or did you? Well, uh, I left Iran in 1969 and went to graduate school thereafter. And then I uh, worked as, a, as the head of the Central Asian Desk in the Voice of America. And at that time, I, I really wanted to go back to Iran again as uh, an officer in the embassy. The opportunity arose in 1976 when I was recruited to become the press attache, but I had to wait a while and go through some training. And so while that was occurring, the revolution started to evolve. Yes, the revolution actually started in January of 78, that is, but earlier the antecedents to it were built by the secular nationalists who were opposing the Shah in terms of the court system. The court systems in Iran were closed and cases were heard only by a small group of people and there was no public hearing at all, just like it is right now. If you're in, if you're in uh, jail by, by the Iranian system right now, there's no public hearing whatsoever and you're guilty before you're considered innocent. So, you had many secular movements uh, to open up society, and at that time, it started to move. And it wasn't until, say, January of 78, when the first movements against the Shah occurred, and slowly but surely, as I'm sitting in Washington, getting ready to go, the momentum starts moving inexorably towards some sort of, I would say, early on, it was a movement, but not a revolution. And once people were killed, and every 40 days, the chela, this, this period, every 40 days when someone dies, there's a commemoration. And that is occurring even today, right now, under this regime. Iranian young, Iranian women and men are getting killed, and f there's a 40th day of that commemoration. By the time that turned around in September, October, November of 78, I was in Iran by then. And I, I was committed to go. But while I was there already, I saw that I couldn't see the Shah turning it around. As much as Washington consi consistently said, the Shah will be there, there is no issue really. It was mistaken, totally mistaken, and no matter what we said in terms of in the embassy, K 
cable traffic and so on, uh, that notion of his survivability was never questioned. Barry, do you think that's to his credit, the Shah's credit? Well, I, I, think, I think it was to the Shah's credit for many years in the sense that his inviability, his notion of inviability, his, his, uh, the notion that he was the preserver of an anti-Soviet containment, that he was the our man in the Middle East, preserving the Middle East for us. Because me, by the, in the early 70s, remember, the Vietnam War was so heavy that basically the Shah, we would, under President Nixon, he gave the Shah anything he wanted, any armament he wanted. But I mean the fact that he didn't commit a Tiananmen Square, for instance. I think it's to the Shah's credit that he, he stepped away and gave up pretty early. At the same time that the Shah was, was moving out of Iran, Somoza was murdering and maiming hundreds of thousands of people in Nicaragua. And to the Shah's credit, he left, you know, at a, at, maybe it was, it was late, but it was early, way earlier than almost anybody would have thought. So I, I do credit him with that. I think he saw the game was up and he was willing to say, I'm out. And he didn't want to see any more bloodshed. He's a very interesting yeah. character. There's, little, there's good, good bits and bad yeah, bits. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and as opposed to this regime that is currently in power, the, the, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, this regime will fight to the bitter end. They have nowhere to go. They don't have the United States to go, go to. They, they, they will kill and maim as, as much as they possibly can to keep power. And the Revolutionary Guards right now are showing that they are willing to shoot people straight up without any emotion whatsoever. And that's very, very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So um, you brought up, obviously, the, the very dangerous situation on the ground now. Uh, you reflected on um, how it was it was starting to, to feel like there was an air of danger. Um, Barbara, at this point, I wanna bring you in. So you obviously, your introduction to Iran was through your husband and it was a very glowing um, and positive um, picture, uh, portrait that, that he painted for you. But when, when it turned, for you, it's, was it before they were taken? Was it the first? Um, the first experience when the embassy over, was overrun? He went over, like I said, around Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter was, it was like three months old at that time. Um, we were supposed to go together. She was a little late coming, and then she had to wait and get shots before she was allowed to um, travel. And by that time, the people were already being told to leave. Families were told to leave Iran. So Barry was sent alone, and he was excited. He would call with all these exciting stories. You know, I, I think <laughs> you were enjoying yourself. <laughs> I would, I, for Barry, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I was enjoying myself. I was saying I was living through a was. <laughs> I was living through a revolution. And, he, and but he was there for the. You were there in the Peace Corps for the inauguration or the coronation of the Shah, and now you were there at the end of his regime, and so you kind of bookmark both sides of the story. And I think you found it tremendously exciting, and you insisted constantly, oh, you're gonna join me soon. You'll be able to come with the kids soon, you know, maybe next month, next week, whatever. And my father's sitting there, and we're watching television with scenes like you just saw, and my father says, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> Uh -uh. <laughs> and so there was this going on up and back. Um, I don't think in the beginning, because he was so positive about what he was doing and excited about what he was doing, that we realized how and how much danger he was actually in. He'd come home like every, what, three months or every, two months? Every three months. Every three months for a couple of weeks. So he saw the kids, you know, in between, we'd go on a little vacation, and then he'd go back, and things were just developing that way. And um, 
we were shocked the first takeover. I think that was far more frightening. Um, it came out on, you know, early morning that the embassy had been taken over. Um, but I think it was very short because we got word right away that everybody was out. By the time we were getting the information was coming in, they were already out. And it was that same day that the ambassador of, from, Afghanistan. from Afghanistan was assassinated. I, I don't think the audience knows that, that, that there were two attempts uh, at the, uh, on the embassy, one on February 14th, 1979, and then, of course, the long one of, of, for 444 days on November 4th. So nine months before November 4th, the embassy was attacked by the Fedayin Echal, this right-wing uh, Islamic group that uh, had been killing um, Americans throughout the 70s. Uh, what they were do, uh, attempting to do was to kill all of us in the embassy, and they had made it up, up the staircase and I did, in fact, uh, um, give up the, the embassy. Uh, um, the ambassador ordered me to do so. Because you spoke. I spoke Farsi, but the, the issue was that then we were brought downstairs and we were about to be executed. And of all crazy things, uh, at that time, Khomeini didn't have the total antipathy toward us at that time and was convinced by those around him to save us. And his military actually came and did uh, prevent the, the massacre of, of the entire diplomatic corps in, at the embassy. Mm -hmm. But that, look, that should have been, that was the prelude. Uh, we were brought back home to the United States and we had discussions about whether we should go back or not. And you also had a long period. You stayed home longer than about, usual yeah. at that point. Well, the, you know, the, the, the problem was what should we do about Iran? It's no longer the Shah, but we still have the Soviet Union. Remember, this is the Cold War. So what do we do? Do we close up shop or do we go back in and try to be there for this success, successor regime? I well, a lot you know, of people yeah. didn't go back. Right. And you chose to. Right. No, you know, it was it was it was one of these things, and you know, I think many of us might uh, think it back I, I in, think in, in your own life. Downstairs, that profiles of courage, quote, right? <laughs> yes. That you know, circumstances come about, and you make a choice. And I think that your love, respect, and your your dedication, not only to Iran but to Iran and the United States, made you go back at that time. You know, but in retrospect, I still think that as, as much as I thought I was doing the right thing, it was really hubris on my part, thinking that nothing could happen to me, that I knew Iran, I knew Iranians, they would never harm me. But uh, I was absolutely wrong. And I mean, individually, they wouldn't, because uh, even afterwards, I mean, when, when did we go to uh, Paris? In 1998, I met one of the people who held me hostage. He was the mas mastermind, Abbas Abdi. Um, and and when, we, when we get there, they sit, the women went over on one side. Barry goes over with the men, this whole group. He takes off his jacket, they roll up their sleeves, and they all start talking in Farsi. And it was the most interesting thing to see how the, the conversation went up and back. By the end of the week, Abdi had been giving us a present every day. He personally apologized and said that they were holding the wrong person in holding Barry. So there, there was, he has this love for Iran. And, and it was very important, I think. And when you have somebody, and I think that the Peace Corps set this up, that you were young and you did fall in love with Iran, and that you always wanted to have this relationship between the United States and Iran. And I think at this point he would even, if they say, do we need somebody to go back, he'd probably say, yeah, <laughs> you know. See, I, I, think I, 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 don't, I don't know, you know, it's a good, good question. But, but, but I still think it's, it, was, it was hubris on my part that I, 
I said uh, uh, that I'd go back to Iran. I had my wife, I had two young children, and I was only thinking possibly only of myself, really. But again, you knew we were taken care of. Barbara's mother and father always took care of the kids. And, so, and the whole and, family. And the whole family. I mean, it was right. a, you know, a big family that, yeah. and, and that was so important. You know, when you talk about people, one part of the, the family going away, Barry going away, but there was a lot of support. I wasn't alone. I had my parents, I had my sister, I had my grandmothers. You know, there's a big, big Italian family surrounding us, and, and they, were, they were good. They were there. They were there for us. They took up the slack so that you didn't have to. You know, your mom was there, too. Right. You didn't have to worry. We took care of your mom when she needed right. people to, you know, to come over and, and, and help her through this whole thing, too. So families are very important. I think we are, uh, in the audience, getting, uh, getting a sense of why you were this incredible spokesperson, <laughs> Barbara. And so I'm going to come back to that. But I just want to say, if there are questions for the Rosens or for Robert in the room, please feel free to come up to the microphone. Um, and and we'll, we'll take questions from the audience. So as people are gathering their courage to come up to the microphone to ask questions. Oh, first person. OK. I'll ask a question, if I could. Uh, Barry, you mentioned about the Shah's reluctance to use the force necessary to stay in power when he left Iran. Isn't it equally plausible that he was replaying what he had done 25 years earlier when the uh, Iran was becoming a democratic republic and eliminating the monarchy, and he left Iran so the CIA could come in and reverse the, uh, the democratic process and invite him back in. Isn't it equally plausible that he thought he could leave and the Americans would come in and clean up the situation so he could come back once again? I don't think, I mean, uh, just for the entire audience, I mean, there was this coup in 1953 against uh, uh, Mohammad Mossadegh, the democratically elected uh, uh, Prime Minister of Iran, and which the CIA played a very important role. But I don't think the Shah really had any commitment from the United States in 1979 that the United States would, would in, in fact, come in and protect him. We didn't really have any thought of doing that at all. President Carter was totally against any, any troop movements, anything like that. So I think the Shah knew that his, that his time was up, that he had no way to convince the United States that he needed, you know, help. But the Iranians think That's, that yeah. that was going to happen yeah, because yeah. of what Iranians happened thought in, that yeah. that was entirely in Algiers. Plausible. Right, right. The, the Iranians, on the other hand, true. Yeah. The Iranians, on the other hand, that was one of the things that they always kept belting at President Carter, that, you know, that the Shah was a puppet of the United States, so that they expected, the Iranians expected the United States to protect the Shah. But Jimmy Carter ha did, was not in any, any mood in, in that sense at all. I think President Carter, uh, in, you know, though he's been criticized many, many, many times over, I think uh, he was badly, badly uh, um, advised during that crisis, and I think that uh, he would even admit that right now. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Uh, you had mentioned briefly about the media during the, the crisis. And I was wondering if you could comment upon uh, the amazing thing that happened. I think it was amazing anyway. It was the, the whole Nightline, Ted Koppel, ABC News uh, development. Because to my knowledge, there was, that was now that wouldn't seem surprising with all of the media we have. But at that time, that was unique. <laughs> and I was wondering if you could comment upon that. It did. It became... It but it became the fascination of the entire country, and we were all fixated on it. But what, and I remember asking one of the reporters, so what did we learn in 444 days? This was towards, you know, like at the very end. What does the American, what do the American people know now that they didn't know about Iran at the beginning, other than Magba Amrika 
night after night after night. That's all we saw. When Kapo was on, he went on um, the latest news from Iran at 11 o'clock at night. It was like, what, 4 o'clock in the morning? Mm -hmm. Or 6 o'clock in the morning? There was no new news. It was just a rehash of everything that had happened. And I don't think any of the news programs that were on did a, a you know a, a, a good analysis of what was happening. It was um, us against them when up on the on, on the um, clip. the clip yeah and it said the making of an American uh, was it enemy uh -huh. the making of an American en en enemy that's exactly what happened. We didn't come away from it with any understanding. It was all the ugliness and the them yelling at us and then you know well, we had our hostages there mm -hmm. so you know but it did transform the american news media the, the news it's media it's that, that we inhabit today is a direct outgrowth of that experience and i'll just tell you a quick story that's not in the film I'll try to do this as succinctly as possible there's a guy named rune arledge who was the head of abc news at the time of the hostage crisis, and his prior job had been the head of ABC News, uh, ABC Sports, and he had presided over the when the the Black September Palestinian militant group took over the 1972 Olympics, and took um, there was a hostage crisis, and several Israeli athletes were were killed. That. He was in charge of ABC News. ABC News had the contract to broadcast the Olympics all over the world. Black September did that because they could get the attention of the world. And it was covered by their sports network people. And it became a gigantic ratings bonanza. Um, the entire world was watching this. So when, when, when uh, the hostage crisis happened, Rune Aller said, aha, right? And he started this show called America to Hold Hostage has the same ba 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 ba. It's it was became Nightline, right? And that was and that was going up against Johnny Carson. It was beating Johnny Carson at the ratings. It's like whoa, and they kept feeding this thing. And because it, and it's the beginning of the merge where where the news media starts to merge with the entertainment industry, and so spectacle and drama and outrageousness, death to America, burn the American flag, president in effigy screaming uh, and then the the hostage takers themselves would have press conferences and say we're going to kill all the hostages and we're going to put them on trial and the more outrageous the more attention they got right and and then then the more attention they got the more outrageous they were and everybody would say and everybody would say that the only time they were out there right. demonstrating in front of the embassy was when they turned on the lights right. and then everybody exactly. got and up and you go a block away from the embassy it was just like it was just like a normal place right and so you can see today, you know, you do something outrageous, you say something crazy and outrageous, and you get attention, and that feeds back the symbiotic relationship. And that's, you know, it's still playing out to this day. But what it did do was that the American people were so supportive. I mean, as a country, I, 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 I don't even know how to say, you know, thank you to everybody for the amount of love and support um, that the hostages received while they were there and then when they came home. Mm -hmm. And I think that that helped a lot with, um, with healing and um, putting things back together again. So, yeah. There's an incredible clip in the film um, when the hostages received just piles and piles of letters mm -hmm. from school children, from mm -hmm. people around yeah, the yeah. country. Um, and it's just, it's really striking because as, as critical as we are of the media and how they took advantage and in a lot of ways but, exploited, they also gave you a microphone. A microphone, and, not some, and that's very important because there are still people who are being held hostage in Iran today. And the families don't know what to do. Fam you know, I didn't know what to do. Do you talk to them? You don't talk to them. If you say something, you know, are they going to take it out on Barry? I don't know. I had no experience in this. And you kind of figure things out a little bit as you go along. Also, you feel very um, powerless. I can't do anything to affect him. But being able to talk to the media gave me an outlet. And I did feel that that was a bit of, of strength that I got from that, um, and that I could influence the situation. So yeah, there's, it's a very 
complicated relationship. And in some ways it's good, and in some ways, you know, you feel like you're being used. I didn't like people to know who I was. You know, I'm, I don't want to go out on the street and somebody say, you know, but I think, you know, you know, I like no, my But I think the using the media is, uh, for in many instances, is an important way to exercise uh, some policy issues. Uh, I, for one, this winter went on a hunger strike in Vienna, uh, right in front of the negotiating uh, venue for the JCPOA, the Joint uh, Commission on, 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 the, uh, on the Bomb, uh, that is uh, on development, new, new, uh, the uh, um, JCPOA. JCPOA. So I, I purposely went on a hunger strike so that I could somehow intervene in some way, shape, or form well, and focus say, attention. And focus attention on the well, lives of, of these hostages who are being taken by Iran right now. There are three of them now. There was four when I went to Vienna. And I think the idea of this is to raise the, the notion that, you know, these people are human beings and, and mm -hmm. way beyond a, 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 an agreement, a, an agreement that is important, yes, but I think these human lives are more important. And funny story, he's in the same hotel as the Iranian delegation. And the Iranian delegation called the police and said that he was threatening them. <laughs> more, more questions from the audience, please. We have a question from an online viewer. January 1980, what was the result in negotiations after the Canadian rescue of six hostages? Um, th there was no, there was no, no negotiations. there were no negotiations for the six Canadian, six Americans who were being uh, um, brought, out. brought out by the Canadians. The Canadians, th these six Americans were part of the embassy. They fled to the Canadian embassy in Tehran and for, for several weeks and months they were protected and then they were brought out by the Canadian ambassador out of Tehran, and this was a, an amazing move where, uh, you know, the film Argo is about that, but really the credit should be given to the Canadian ambassador rather than the CIA for anything that was done at that time. So there were no negotiations for these six. These people were luckily saved by the Canadian embassy. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's only two. In the audience? Okay. Yes. Should we have withdrawn our embassy, all our staff, all our embassy staff, all our em and personnel, including the ambassador, of course, uh, before the before the hostage crisis? We, in, 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 uh, the, the, do you think? Well, you know, that's a good question um, because uh, yeah. the the embassy. When we learned that that from Ambassador Sullivan that uh, the president had ordered the admission of the Shah into the country, into the United States, we had several days. So that was done on October 22nd, uh, 1979. So from October 22nd to November 4th, we were constantly cabling Washington and constantly trying to convince Washington not to admit the Shah into the United States. But you also but, expected that if he did, yeah. you would have been sent yeah, home, but, the embassy well, if, would have been closed, at least for a period of time. Yeah, we, we, we had thought that if, if uh, the Shah was in the United States and if there was some reaction in Iran, they would have demanded our exit from the embassy and leave the country. But no one ever expected a takeover, except for one person, President Carter. President Carter did say that, as you saw in the film. Mm -hmm. But there was no one in that cabinet room who answered him, no one. I think it's really important to point out also that the reason that the hostage crisis was prolonged for 444 days, most Americans think, oh, it's because they hated America and what, what's, what got, because we sort of see things through our own sort of narcissism. Uh, What's, what was lost is the, the 
central role that the hostage crisis had in this internal power struggle in Iran that, that allowed Khomeini to coalesce. Khomeini was not fully in charge of the whole country Absolutely. at that point. Absolutely. And he was, he was struggling, though there's still, as you saw in the clip, there were all these uh, factions. And when Khomeini embraced the hostage takers and threw his weight behind that, and the whole country was emotionally sort of riled up by this event, Khomeini used that to silence all opposition and, and take control of the whole country, which is, and the theocracy took hold, and that's the, the, the country we live in today. But, but, but it also happened right? here too, because there was, that was election year. And so Ronald Reagan right. used it, along with um, um, uh, David Casey. Rockefeller right. and Chase Casey. Manhattan right. Bank, and there was a whole thing going on. They may have gotten home you know, before Thanksgiving instead of January 20th at the moment of the inauguration. Right. But well, the reason, the reason it's called taken hostage is like every, the media was taken was, hostage by the, the, you were taken hostage, yeah. obviously. The America was held hostage to its lust for oil. Um, the, the Carter was held hostage. Uh, I mean, you could go on that in the line. Almost everybody yeah, but, was held hostage. But you know, to Robert's point about uh, what Khomeini did with the hostage crisis, when I was first taken that day on November 4th, I was tied up thrown into one of these rooms, and I was able to hear the Iranian radio, and there it said that Ayatollah Khomeini was supporting the takeover of the embassy and supporting the students following the line of the imam. And once I knew, I heard that, I said, we're going to be here for a long time, and that means also, as Robert said too, Khomeini was consolidating the revolution, his revolution, getting rid of any disparate opposition whatsoever, putting people in jail, executing people, so that he could have his Islamic Republic. I'm gonna just do the last question from the audience and yes. we'll wrap since you've been waiting patiently. Great, thank you very much. You. Uh, so my question, just to put it up front, is um, your thoughts on what you've done here versus pop culture movie, and somebody has already uh, mentioned Argo. Um, but allow me just to, how I get to my question. This is the West Point um, U.S. Military Academy uh, newspaper. What is it, I guess, maybe weekly or so. Uh, I, I've kept this for now a little over 40 years. And the headline on it is, West Point Embraces Hostages. And it starts with uh, a message from General Goodpaster, who was the superintendent of the military academy at the time. And there's actually a little bit of a backstory to General Goodpaster. But flash forward 40 years after, and you and I may have actually made eye contact back there in early 1981. It's not outside of the uh, possibility. The uh, Flash forward four decades, I'm with my adult nephews and nieces, or a few of them, and they want to watch a movie. And so they're flipping through Netflix, and my adult niece sees the movie Argo, and she says, oh, let's watch that. I just love that movie. I've watched it a hundred times. And so I asked her, um, do, do you know the backstory a little bit to all the events that led up to Argo. And after a little bit of uncomfortable kind of conversation, she sort of sheepishly says, well, I guess I've only really watched it four times, and I don't really know the background story, but I love the movie. Um, and with that as sort of the setup, maybe you would comment on pop culture movie uh, versus uh, what you've done here. Well, this is the point. I mean, this is exactly why I set out to make this movie. Is yeah, Argo probably had a, a, a bigger influence <laughs> on younger people. That's probably all they know about this whole thing. And um, and so context is everything. Things don't happen in isolation. And uh, I feel like. Most Americans are, when they hear anything about what's going on in the Middle East, they're just walking through a forest with blinders on. It makes no sense. It's all confusing. They all hate us. Why do they hate us? What's going on? Why are we doing this? Why did we spend, they're saying, the invasion of Iraq will eventually cost us like six trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. Thousands of Americans have died. Every day we, we, we turn on the news and there's some 
issue going on in the Middle East that impacts us here at home, now price of oil, things like this, but with no understanding of the historical context. And with no understanding of the historical context, there's no, un, there's no positive solutions to these problems and an understanding of where we go from here. And I think, you know, really struck me just watching this clip again, um, uh, just how similar what we're doing with the Saudis is like what we did with the Shah. It's the same, and now we've got, and the Iranians are really our natural ally in the Middle East, don't you think? Absolutely, absolutely. They, they, Not the Saudis. Yes, they are. Yeah. Look, I mean, the democratic institutions that were built over decades in, in Iran just fell apart because of our total misunderstanding of, of, of Iran's democratic instincts. And uh, that's something we're paying for now, and we're paying for in our alliance with the, with the Saudis, too. You know, to, to your point about Argo, one of the th things I really despise about that film is, uh, you know, though many Americans love it, is that uh, it doesn't really relate to the hostage crisis. It has nothing to do, it somehow disengages from the first scene, and then from there on it's the story of how the CIA was able to uh, help six Americans escape from a horrible place. Because, because. That's, that was the story, really, more than anything else. CIA were the heroes. Canadians weren't heroes. The 52 Americans sitting in the embassy are not heroes, but the, but the CIA was. Because it turned, it turned what was an embarrassment and a humiliation of the United States into a positive. Look at us. We got them out, and they chased them down the runway with machine guns. Which was not true. That never happened. Nobody knew they were out of Iran until they appeared on TV with Jimmy Carter, like two days later, whatever it was, when they got home. Right, right. That's how secret the whole thing was. So, but you know, that's what we like to do. You know, <laughs> yay America. <laughs> We're going to have to end it there. Thank you for the question. Thank you, everyone in, in the audience, for joining us today. And just, again, a, a, a special round of applause for our guests, Robert Stone, Barbara Rosen, and Barry Rosen. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the Kennedy Library for, um, for hosting us tonight for this special preview. Um, you are great partners to us. I hope we get to do it again soon. Thank you. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that the full film, Taken Hostage, airs next week, November 14th and 15th, if you're in Boston on GBH2, if you're anywhere else on PBS stations in your area. Again, thank you and have a great night.